ladies, don't be afraid of the front row, please. And I'm waiting on uh, Yahya, the communications guy, to let me know we can go ahead and start. Everything's good. Uh, and and capture the video too, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Capture the video as well. Let y'all get the water first here. Testing, testing. Okay, we're going to open up. We're going to let our dear rabbi open us up with a prayer. in the name of the merciful, the compassionate one who orders our universe, who creates us, who's brought us together happily today on this joyous occasion uh, uh, as we prepare those uh, who are among us who are sisters and brothers of the Muslim tradition for the holy month of uh, Ramadan, uh, which inspires all of uh, humanity when we understand how many of our sisters and brothers are focused on doing charity and on acts of uh, kindness and justice should be an inspiration to all of us. We pray that that spirit of uh, Ramadan uh, Mubarak or Karim, a blessed Ramadan and a joyous Ramadan uh, will bring joy not just to this beautiful community in Masjid Muhammad, uh, its sisters and brothers, but to all of our faith communities in the nation's capital and around the world, and because God has brought us together tonight, may that little event, that little drop uh, in the universe uh, reflect on all of humankind, uh, and may those blessings come from each of us to all of those we care about to all of our world, and let those who will say amen. We want to thank the rabbi for those wonderful words. And uh, we say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and that is with Almighty God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Uh, we want to welcome you all uh, to this evening's event here at Masjid Muhammad, the nation's mosque. Uh, this is a, if this is your first time here, uh, we want you to know that this is a historical uh, facility. Uh, this community is a 80 plus year community. I think it's 82 years old. Uh, today, and uh, this is the first Muslim, it being the oldest, this is the first obviously Muslim community in the nation's capital. Uh, we have, uh, I think the next one that came was Ahmadiyya. They came in 1950 and they purchased some property uh, near uh, Embassy Row area in 1950. We go back to 1930s, and then the others begin to come. So, uh, this is the second mosque built from the ground up uh, in America's capital city. This is the first mosque, though, built that's a community mosque. Uh, the other mosque is one on uh, Embassy Road on Massachusetts, uh, mainly built for diplomacy. It was actually first uh, a, a museum, and it's the Islamic Center uh, today. And that's, that's mainly uh, for diplomats 
uh, in the area, and they've done a good job of maintaining that uh, very beautiful architectural structure, uh, with this one being more grassroots. Um, those that built this uh, were descendants of uh, enslaved Africans. And of course, we're in D.C., so we all know that D.C. is the first place in America's history where the slaves were, were freed first uh, in the country. And uh, one of the slaves that, uh, one of the ancestors of the community is uh, Yaro Mahmoud. Uh, Yaro Mahmoud was enslaved in 1752. And of course, just hearing that, hearing that year, you know that's a decade, more than a decade before America declared independence. And he was right here in D.C., 1752. Uh, brought in through Annapolis, like many other ones, Kunta Kinte and others came in through Annapolis, et cetera. And he ended up getting his freedom. Uh, a very beautiful story about how he got his freedom. And uh, he was seen praying. He ended up buying a home in Georgetown, uh, actually not far from one of the presidents uh, during that time. And um, he was praying in his backyard facing east. What you just saw, those who were here, the prayer we just did, he did that prayer uh, in his backyard facing east back then. And um, there's a book about him by uh, John Johnson. He lives in Maryland. John Johnson lives in Maryland. Yaru was made famous by two paintings. There's one in Georgetown Library, and there's one in Philadelphia of Yaru. And in the book that was done on Yaru, this ancestor, this Muslim ancestor, uh, in the book that was done on him, it says that he is buried in his, in his backyard in the area where he used to make his prayer. So his house, that area was purchased years ago. And of course, we all know in the DC area, property is worth a lot. And you purchase property, you're trying to turn it around, and especially Georgetown. And uh, so, but what we did was, when we found out that he was buried there, based on what the book was saying, we asked the owner to allow us to do a ceremonial prayer for him that he, we know he did not receive, that Muslims have, we asked them. And of course, they want to know about how much time. We didn't think it would take that much long, but so we worked with, uh, uh, in fact, uh, well, I just saw Dr. Frazier coming, he's praying now. Dr. Frazier was working with Howard University, uh, their excavation team, uh, Florida State University Center, the excavation team, uh, DC Office of Historic Preservation got involved, the mayor's office got involved, the National Museum wasn't up at the time, uh, but they were involved, and of course, the, the ambassadors from the land where he came from, uh, they were all involved, and we started the excavation. Uh, in Georgetown in the backyard trying to get to his remains. And what happened, I guess it was taking a little too long. And we had gotten to the 1800s and we started finding things that was in his home, that was in his house. And uh, at that, right at that same time, the owners were saying, it's all right, that's it. We have to cut the project, project off. So we, we had to settle for getting that close. And we decided at that time to go ahead and have that ceremonial uh, prayer for him. And uh, it was actually sent around the world. Saudi Arabia did a big piece on it in its international magazine. And uh, we had a program at that same location. And, and, and everybody I just told you that was involved, they had speakers there and others spoke. It was a wonderful program uh, that took place. And all that has a tribute to this history right here. Now what we found out is that we have property in Southeast that was owned by the slave masters of Yaru. We didn't know it. And we had it for five decades. But that is, that, that's on, it's actually on the deed. That slave master's on the deed of that property that we have. And we get ready to develop it now and put a bunch of housing up over there now. We were able to keep it and expand on it. It used to be actually, when he was there, a slave and everything. It was just a stable uh, for the slaves and that kind of thing. And, and also the livestock and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, now we have the first uh, American Islamic Heritage Museum is in that location now. And of course, Yaru, he's in there, in there because he's part of that history. It actually has eight centuries of Islam in this land right here, which America is not even eight centuries. Uh, but we have that in the museum showing that history. And they have the, five, uh, the past five centuries, they're dedicated rooms on up to where we are now uh, in terms of the history of Islam in America. And this is Dr. Frazier, who was very uh, pivotal and integral to that project on uh, Yaru Mahmoud. Glad he's able to be with us. He and I just did a, um, a program today, a radio program today on uh, extremism. Uh, we're doing some dynamic work in that area. So Ramadan is upon us. Ramadan comes in certainly when the new moon changes, and it is the new moon for the ninth month. The ninth month. 
and it's no accident, no coincidence. And actually, we look at we, when we look at the dates of Revelation coming to the various prophets, they actually there are dates in this month. The Psalms come to David, the Suhu to Ibrahim, etc. We find out those dates are in this month. When we go back, so this is a month of Revelation. You know, when Revelation was sent down. But the ninth month has a lot to do with the nine months in the womb of the mother. So we're fasting in this ninth month, and you come in with a new moon. And moon, uh, really, in scriptural language, is a reference to the mind, to the mind of the human being. It goes through, the mind goes through things. It fills, it empties. And uh, the moon doesn't, doesn't have light of its own. The moon reflects the light of the sun. And that's what man is. He's a reflector. He's a, he's a thinker. So this month of scripture and fasting is a month of deep reflection and pondering on the signs, the communication of Almighty God. And that's what the, the verses in the Quran are called. The word is ayat. That's the classical term, ayat, which means signs. And everything outside of the Quran that's in the creation are also called the same word. And God said there are signs all around you. And the first, so what so it tells us, it says that if all the trees were pens and all the oceans ink, it couldn't exalt the words, the wisdom of Almighty God that we'll find in the vast creation. And when we look at the creation, we, we call this vast thing the universe. Universe. And we know uni means one. And verse, well, I just mentioned verse, about the Quranic verse. So it's talking about, so I, and I translated what that verse means in the classical language. It's a communication. It's a sign. And that's what the verse is. So this whole thing is one communication. One consistent communication. And then we have, we have from that word universe, we have added city. University. I just went to the Brigham Young University. One of the top universities in our nation doing some dynamic things. And I was just so pleased to be there. And uh, you all will be surprised to know there's a lot of Muslims that go to that university. And they have one of the top linguist programs, not just in the nation, but in the world. And I was very, very impressed uh, with, their, with, their, with their linguist program and the linguist that they do. But that just says a city that has extracted from the communication, and they've categorized it and put it in different subjects, and they teach it, and it all comes from the one creator. Now, what Brigham Young University does, a lot of the other universities don't do, is they don't give credit. They give credit to where all that knowledge comes from. A lot of the other universities don't do that. They give credit to the professors, the scholars, et cetera. And so, and then you have also from universal, universe, they add soul, universal. And we say something universal, that means it applies to everybody. But that's a play on S-O-U-L, universal. You see, this is a communication to the one human soul. There's only one human soul. Just like there's only one human. There are no two types of human. You know, we have presentations, uh, we speak, people hate us because of race. But my race can save them because it's the human race. I have a part in my body that can save a person that hates me that may be a white supremacist, et cetera. In fact, it's a wonderful story. I used to be in, um, I was in the military for 30 years, and one of my jobs was an equal opportunity person. And uh, we ended up connecting with a ex-extremist leader, white supremacist leader. He's no longer that, he was on the run, he's working with the FBI now, and he came in to speak about what led him to get out. He mentioned five things. Two of them really hit me. All of them were strong points, but two of them really hit me. And I'll share these two with you, and then I'll get ready to bring up our panelists, and we'll hear from them. They don't have to come up, but you can hear from me where they are. If they come up, they write. They like to come up. Uh, but he said, he said, uh, now he was, you've probably seen that movie, America X or whatever. You see how, you saw how extreme they could be. He was extreme uh, like that, very extreme. And in, 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 in did some things that we see those types of, uh, that, that mind, that mind does. So, so one day, he had, he had two children. He had a three-year-old and a six-year-old. He was watching a program 
called, he was sharing this with us now. This is, he, he was sharing the different things with us in terms of some of the things that led him, that, that turned the light on for him, that helped him. And he said, he said they, his, him and his little son, three-year-old, they were, they were watching a program called Gullah Gullah Island, I believe it was. As some of you may it's an old program, it was a comedy. You know, it's, I guess, uh, the, he's from the, the Geechee area, Gullah Geechee, South Carolina, that's one of the areas of the coast. Uh, that's the only group of, of so-called descendants of slaves in all of America that has maintained more of the culture than any other in all of America. And I, I'm from North Carolina and we visit them, et cetera. Uh, but they were watching a program, which was a comedy program, and they were just all these Africans, uh, blacks, what do you want, whatever term you want to use, and they, and, and they were laughing loud. He was sitting there with him and the three-year-old, it, it just had them laughing. And then all of a sudden, the six-year-old came into the room where they were laughing and shut, cut the television off in a very violent way and turn to his father and say, what is wrong with you? You know we don't laugh and look at these and he said the N-word. A six-year-old. And, 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 and he was, while that was going on, I mean, he was trying to get his composure to, to go from this laughter, which is human. We all, it's the same. And, to, and then hearing that and then looking at the three-year-old it was, it, that was, it didn't break, it wasn't, that wasn't it, but it was, he, he made a note of that, you know. And another thing he said that was impactful was his mother was ill, very ill. And no one was able to help her. And then she needed also a kidney. Now, so two things happened with this incident. The one thing he wasn't, he wasn't supposed to know, but because of, his, because of what he was, he was able to, to know, and this is what it was. The only daughter that could save him, save his mother, happened to be an uh, African American that was able to save his mother's life. The doctor, and then also the body part, I mentioned that earlier, the kidney also came from an African American. And so it hit him. We all one. It's only one human type. There are no two types of human. They don't study the types of human. There's only one type of human. Biologist, biologist, settle it. Another, the heart is the heart. All of human beings have 12 systems in the body. They're, and all that's connected with the 12 disciples, it's connected with the solar system, the, the, the celestial, the zodiac sign, 12 months. All that's, all that's connected, you know, and it's all the same. So if there's only one human, and we go back to that parent, Adam, and his mate, some say Eve, some say Howard. And we're here, if there's one human type, there's only one human soul, universe soul. And that's one of the things that this month of fasting has a focus on because it opens up like this. Yeah, I love Dina Amini. Kutuba Aleikum Mustiyamu Kemma Kutuba Ala Ladina. Men, listen to this. Men, Hubalikum. Men, Hubalikum, La Alakum. Tatakun. Now, I put emphasis on that part because I want to make a, a very important point on that part that I just said. But this is what it says. I'm going to say it in English. I want to highlight that classical language piece. Oh, you who have faith. Oh, you who enter into faith, you who believe. And so it's really, it says, fasting is a prescription for you. Or some translate it is prescribed for you. Kutubat means it's actually written upon you as a part of who you are. Fasting. Kutubat, the, the actual uh, uh, grammar. Uh, it's prescribed for you, it's written upon you as it was prescribed or written upon or a part of the life of those who came before you. And who came before the Muslims? Jews, Christians, and there are others, right? Now, and we're going to hear about fasting in the various traditions. So look, Almighty God is telling us that it's not just for you, it's not new to you. There are those who came before you that did this, the same thing. We, we looked at Moses, the 40 days, the 30 days. Of, we, we, we'll, hear, we'll hear some stuff about the fact. I want to get into anybody's talk. <laughs> so we're going to hear about that. But I want you to look at the other part. Men, habalikum. That means came before. Now, I, I emphasize that for really the Muslims. So I'm going to share it with you all as well, too. Kabbalah, you hear this word, Kabbalah? We just prayed. That some may came in after the prayer, but we just prayed. We turned in a certain direction. It's called Qibla. The direction 
the, wherever Muslims are in the world, they have to turn towards what's called the Qibla. Qibla means just what this word meant, Qibla means what came before. So God is reminding Muslims every single day, Muslims are being reminded every single day to focus on what came before the very life that they're standing upon right now, turning towards. And what came before is our original life, our original identity, our common life, back to Adam. Back to Adam. That, that, on that picture in the back, that square house called the Kaaba, uh, Buniyat, uh, Linnas, uh, Mecca. It's called Becca, we know in the, in the secret scriptures. Uh, Becca, but that built by, Ab the, the foundation is laid by Adam, and it was erected by Abraham. Uh, we, and and uh, uh, Lehum al-Salam, uh, peace be upon both of them. So God is telling Muslims every day, at least five times a day, and they do extra prayer, so he's doing more times. Facing, they have to face that direction. Uh, your prayer is not accepted. The only way your prayer will be accepted is if you just don't know. But you can't turn any other way. You have to face that to be connected with all of human life. And that's what we're supposed to think about during the month of Ramadan. All of human life, all of human beings, and how we are a part of each other, and how we can help each other become united as, 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 a, as a mankind, humanity. That's the biggest, one of the biggest divides is hum, hum, humanity. We're divided. Uh, you know, it's one of the biggest divides. And it's difficult, that's a big struggle to try to unite humanity. This is a beautiful picture. We have, we have united faith communities. We know some countries are having problems with this. They're struggling with this. But we are together. We're together here. And again, you're gonna hear from some of the leaders of, of, in other ways, there are many more. This is just a few, and we're just so proud to have our guest speakers here with us uh, today for this month of, of fasting. Uh, we'll be fasting from dawn to sunset, and it's about maybe 12 hours, I guess, because uh, uh, we have to start fasting about 4.45 in the morning. Can't eat anything after that. And then I think it's 8 o'clock at night is uh, when we'll be breaking that fast right now, and of course, as the time goes on. No food, no drink, uh, but that's not the only thing. You also have to, things that you, your mind feeds. We say food for thought. So that kind of food too. We have to be conscious of the food that we take into mind, not just the body, because our dear prophet, the prayer of peace upon him, said that if you just fast from food and drink, but you've taken other things, your behaviors hadn't changed, then your fast is not accepted, and you might as well not even be fasting. If that's the only thing you get out of hunger and you haven't changed any other behavior, you know, to make you a better person, a better human being. It's what, and it's trying to get us back. I mentioned the ninth month. I'm going to go ahead and transition after this. The ninth month is when the baby comes. And the baby, that's our common life. We talked about Adam, and, uh, and we hear this from me all the time. I'm also the chairman of the Interfaith Conference. We have two of our members here, and we hear this all the time. Adam, when he was created, it was stated he was created on the sixth day, and he was excellent. Everything is said, you know, we know the six days is consistent among the, all these faiths up here, basically. The six days of creation is consistent in our scriptures. And what God created on the first day was good, excellent, good on everything. The same thing was said about it. So Adam came with that same excellent, excellent life and nature. And he didn't have a racial identity, didn't have an ethnic identity, didn't have a national identity. He was human. That was his identity. And that's the first identity. If that's the first identity given to us by the one that created us, that tells us that that has to be the most important identity, human. And that's what Muslims have to focus on every day, that identity. And from Adam, from that, from Adam, came all of the wonderful, beautiful, diverse expressions of human life, all from the human family of Adam. Now, some of the faiths that's part of our group, they might not use that name. They may use somebody else or use something else, but it's still, there has to be a start. So we know we all come from a start. We didn't create ourselves, so that's a start. So when the baby comes here, so the ninth month, we're trying to get us back to this original nature, when we come from our mother, a place really is paradise, it's a garden, because you can't commit no wrong, can't commit no sin in there, and when you come from that garden, where everything was provided for you that you needed, when you come from that garden, you're pure, you're innocent, you're loving, you're not a criminal, you're not a murderer. You don't come here hating anybody. And you're not conscious of yourself as a race. You're not conscious of your ethnicity. You're not conscious of your nationality and all these other ladies. In fact, you don't even know your name. You're not even conscious of your name. You don't, you don't, you're human, you're just human. You cry the same, you love the same. You're human. And that's what God wants to see. And you're ready to be shaped 
and build upon the excellence that God gave you, that excellent life that God gave you. So this is what Ramadan seeks to get us back to on that path of excellence. We, you know, we fall and we get short and we have to go back to Almighty God, clean ourselves up, repent, whatever the case might be, be born again. And, and that's why I say be born again, right? Get back to the state of the baby. That's what born again means. Go back to the state of the baby when you come in with no sin on you. you get you be clean. You have to go to God for that, right? So with that, I want to transition now so we can hear from our uh, dear panelists. We're going to start from our dear brother uh, on the end, uh, Bill Aiken. Uh, he is a Buddhist. He is currently the president of the Interfaith Conference, which is the oldest interfaith conference in all of America that brings Muslims to the table. It started out with four, and now we're very diverse. And that was 40 years ago. And we're commemorating and celebrating our 40th anniversary right now as we're speaking. And I know, I know both of them may speak about that, and, uh, and we'll say more about what on this end in a few minutes, but we're gonna, uh, so Bill, if you wanna come up, you can, or if you wanna sit, you can, but grab that mic right there. Sure. And uh, come on. In fact, I'll just, I'll just give you this, because I don't, come up and grab it. So this, this is good. Okay, you good? Yeah, I'm okay, fine. Right. And if it's okay with you, I'll sit here. Okay, if, that's if fine. If that's okay. Um, Salaam Alaikum, everyone. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak uh, to you all. Um, as as uh, Imam uh, Talib said, that my name is Bill Aiken, I'm a Buddhist. And I say, funny, he doesn't look very Buddhist. Uh, and uh, so I was not born into Buddhism, I was born into the Catholic Church, but during my college years, I, I switched over uh, to Buddhism, which I think caused my mother some gastric distress. But uh, nonetheless, I am so happy to be here at Masjid Muhammad. I, I have a number of memories associated with this place. It's, it's the first place when I was first doing activities with the, uh, in, the uh, um, Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington. One of the first houses of worship I visited, and it's about close to 20 years ago, was here, Masjid Muhammad. It's the first place I heard the Azan. It's the first place I was able to witness uh, men and women at prayer. And so it's always felt, um, you know, uh, very much, you know, a, a deep link in my heart. Also, my personal affection for the Imam and and for the great work that this community has always done, supporting interfaith relations, of the sense of outreach and the kind of profound humanism or, or a sense of humanity that Imam uh, Tava brings to this. So, I feel honored to be able to participate. At first, when I heard the topic that we would talk about fasting on the eve of Ramadan. I also have to say, you know, there's a thing when you work in interfaith and when you work with people of other religions, there's something that happens. Some people think, especially if they strongly hold their faith, you know, they believe strongly in their faith, they think that if I talk to people from other faiths, it might weaken my faith or something like that. But really, it has the opposite effect for me. I find that hearing how other people give play to their faith, how other people express their convictions, it just inspires me and it also makes me appreciate my own faith tradition more in the process. And um, so, and this is, this is a beautiful thing when I reflect on the passage in the Quran that, that where it says that we were all made so differently so we could come to know one another. And I think in that coming to know one another, we really can expand our hearts. We can expand our idea about God, you know, because God is boundless and infinite. We, have finite brains. But as we really come to know each other, we can really open our hearts to how we can imagine God. And so uh, I'm happy to talk to you from the Buddhist tradition that I've been a part of for the last 50 years. Um, I must fully disclose uh, at this point that uh, my tradition, my particular school, there's many schools in Buddhism, and my school doesn't have an actual fasting practice. So I may seem like a slight imposter being up here, but, uh, but, I, but actually in Buddhism, there are, there are some really interesting uh, history and, and uh, dimensions of fasting that do come to play. It starts with the Buddha himself. The Buddha himself who lived 500 BC in Northeast India, he was a prince. He was born into a royal family in that area, a regional king, his father, and he was raised as a prince. And his father indulged every desire he had because he, was a he wanted to keep the son in the family and, and the, the soothsayers had said, 
he'll either be a great prince, this young boy Siddhartha, or he'll be a Buddha. He'll be a, 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 you know, a wise man, a sage. And the father said, well, I don't want to raise no sage. I want someone to inherit the family business. I want someone to, to become a king. So he kept Siddhartha inside the palace, so the legend goes, and every desire of his was fulfilled, every wish fulfilled. He had gorgeous uh, clothing that he wore. He had many beautiful young women attending to him. And so he lived this, this life of complete indulgence. And then later he said, this is not really the right way to live. This isn't the right, the right way to live for me because he became aware of like the impermanence of life, of suffering that was going on outside of the walls. And he said, there has to be more than, to this than life. And so he cut off his long hair. He snuck out of the palace one night. He took off his, you know, sold off his, or gave away his clothing. And he went, in, went forth as an ascetic. And as an ascetic, he would try to outdo all the other ascetics in northern India at that time. So if they were living on three grains of rice a day, he would try to live on two grains of rice a day. And, and basically, uh, in his extreme ascetic practice, he wound up kind of reducing himself to a very unhealthy man. He became very, so weak and so unhealthy that he was passed out along a river when uh, a young woman came by who was a shepherd girl. And she took pity on him, alarmed that he was, you know, there are even Buddha statues that show how gaunt he was that you see nothing but ribs in these statues. That kind of shows that period of his life. So he goes from being all these desires indulged as a prince, then he goes as an ascetic to all these desires being denied. And that didn't seem to be working either. So was this, when this young shepherd girl comes by and she feeds him some porridge, he's able to regain his strength at that point. And he's able to kind of revive his life. And he realizes, if I reduce myself to nothing, how can I ever achieve my goal of enlightenment, of, become, of compassion and these other things? I'm too weak. And so he then sat under the, a tree, as, as, as the legend tells us. And in the morning, when the, the planet of Venus appears, he has a great awakening at that point, And he goes forth. And this great awakening is to the nature of life, the cosmos, the nature of human suffering, etc. And he goes forth to teach. And the, in his very first lecture that he gives as this enlightened one, he talks about something called the middle way. And the middle way becomes a really important point in Buddhism. He, and, he said, and he said, I'm here to tell you, um, he addressed the, the monks that he, had, that he had encountered, saying bhikkhus. These two extremes should not be followed by one gone forth into the monastic life. What two? That which is the pursuit of sensual happiness and sense pleasures, which is low, vulgar, the way of the ordinary person, ignoble, not connected to the goal. And that which is this pursuit of self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, not connected to the goal. Bhikkhus, without veering towards either of these two extremes, the one attuned to reality, one of the Buddha's titles, has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which, get, which leads to peace, to higher knowledge, to full awakening, to nirvana. And the Buddha likened this middle way between indulging our senses and denying our senses, indulging our desires and denying our desires. He likened this to the idea of a, the string of a musical instrument. He said that when, if a string is tuned too sharply, if it's wound too tight, then it will break when you start to play it. It'll snap and you get no music. If, however, if a string is too lax, if a string is just not wound enough, then when you hit it, it'll go boom, 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 boom. Well, you get the idea. So it doesn't make proper music that way either. He said it's only when our mind, when he was liking the string to our mind, when it's tuned properly, that we have that balance between acknowledging our human desires, our, our, what makes us human, and, and the passions we have as human beings, and, and at the same time, our, our quest for higher purpose in life, a, a quest for higher spirituality. And it's how we balance these two. Now, 
going on for how this episode plays into Buddhist tradition later on. Today, if you were in South Asia or Southeast Asia, and you'd see monks on the street there, if you're in Thailand, Cambodia, one of those, one of those places, what monks would do there was when the morning bells ring, at the morning temple bells, the monks leave their, the monks leave their monastery with their begging bowl called a bot underneath their arm. And they go through the town that they're in. And meanwhile, the housewives and, and others and the children have all been preparing food for them. And they'll go out and they'll feed the monks. And they'll feed the monks. And every day, monks have to go out and beg for their food every single day. And the idea being the people feed them and the monks respond to these community members who are supporting them by praying and caring for their well-being as well. This is the tradition in these countries. And for them, the last, move, the last meal of every day is at noon, regardless. It's not a season. It's not, no, it's every single day. The last meal is at noon. So they have to go out and beg in the morning, and then, and then their last meal is at noon. However, it's not quite as impossible as you might think because chocolate was ruled a medicine. So they could take medicine, including, I guess, Hershey's Kisses, uh, afternoon. And then I was talking to a monk um, who is in, he, he's an American-born monk, and he was in a monastery up in upstate New York, and it's pretty cold in upstate New York. And I was visiting him towards the end of winter, so I went up, his name was Deku Bodhi, and so I was asking him, how was this to, you know, to, to be able to get these as well? They've mo he said, these, these rules for monks that they don't eat in the afternoon, they were created in countries way down south, you know, in countries like Cambodia and Thailand and Sri Lanka. These are the countries that, so, but for those of us in the north, we're burning a lot more calories every day. And, and so, it, you know, it becomes a health issue for us. So they let their, uh, they, they made a change in the rules so they can have like Nutramen or something where they have energy drinks. Uh, that they do so they can sustain themselves. So you see again, in Buddhism, this idea is playing between indulgence, so yeah, they can eat every day, and you can take chocolate if you need it, and, uh, but, and between that and balancing towards no uh, denying their desires. But, so instead of fasting though, the Buddha taught what he called, uh, what we would refer to today as mindfulness regarding while eating, that while we're eating, Eating itself gives us a chance for mindfulness. It gives us a chance to, to reflect on, uh, both for monastics and for lay persons. I'm a, obviously a lay person. And this allows one to understand how sensual craving, how our desires arise within our life, how the things that we enjoy you know, gives rise to these sorts of desires. And it helps us have insight in those moments when we're paying attention. It gives us insights into the nature of all the passions and desires that rise up in our life. Some are good. Some lead us in really healthy, good directions. Some lead us into very destructive directions. Being mindful, and especially in being limited and being mindful in our eating, gives us a chance to reflect on how these passions and emotions operate in our life and hopefully lead us to a better way. So uh, again, I'm um, honored to be part of, of your day as you begin on, on, the early, on the holy month of Ramadan. You know, in interfaith relations, there is this concept called uh, holy envy. If you're, I don't know if you've heard that expression before. Holy envy means, well, you know, I believe in the teachings of my school. I'm a Buddhist. I believe in being a Buddhist. I like being a Buddhist. I love being a Buddhist. But there are things about other faiths I really can admire, and even envy. And I'd say, Ramadan, well I, well, I can't make the commitment that I'm going to be joining you in fasting this month. I can't quite go that far. It's just my weakness. But I have to say, it, it is one of those things that w when I've experienced in iftars, but I haven't been invited to iftars by friends and some of the embassies here in Washington, I'm always so moved. It's one of those parts of Islam that I, I love. And uh, so therefore, I'm, for me, it's a delight to be part of, of your uh, pre-Ramadan. Uh, celebration. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Greatly, greatly appreciate that, uh, Bill. Now, I know I've heard it before, but it seems like I've never heard it before. And we, we work together 
uh, quite a bit on the interfaith conference because there are opportunities for us to share like this, but it just sounds like something new every time. Uh, that's, 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 I appreciate that. And you see, you see the, this is unity in diversity. And uh, see, he's mentioning passions and appetites. And this is what Ramadan comes for us to check our appetites, check our passions. Like the, the ap in appetite, some are good, some are not so good. And some people check them and some people don't. And, uh, and that shows, and in, uh, in you see a discipline in the presentation he was given. Discipline is very important. That's one of the definitions of uh, the word uh, taqwa that some translate uh, to God conscious also means self-restraint or self-discipline. Uh, that God wants us to be able to, to come to that. Uh, so we appreciate uh, what you share with us. I'm glad you were able to be here as well. Next we want to hear from uh, dear brother, uh, Elder Calderwood, Kevin Calderwood. Uh, he has a very big responsibility. Uh, he's over a region. Uh, he has one of the, probably the largest region, I believe. Is this the largest region? Yeah, he has the largest region in, in, in America, North, North America. And uh, so we are, you know, that tells you he, he, him taking time to be with us today uh, is, is meaningful and is special. And, uh, and we appreciate him taking that time uh, to be with us. Uh, I was traveling with him. I, I had an invitation to go out to Utah and meet with the leadership uh, at Utah with him, and we had a great time. In fact, if you didn't see it, this newspaper here, we did a, did a whole story on it right here. You got some more of these downstairs. Uh, very wonderful presentations to look at uh, their operation. And uh, after seeing their whole operation out there at their headquarters, the kind of things they're involved in, the production that they're involved in, I mean, they're producing enough food, uh, not just for their own global network of people, they produce enough food to help other people. And they have a global operation helping other people. And they have so many other different things, the shipping, the transportation, the canning, the cheese, the milk. I mean, it was, just, and, and, and uh, it just, I just saw, and they have a, they have a quote that's, that speaks to this as well. But I see them, you know, it says in the, in the scripture, and the Quran is the same thing, it's, it's said differently. In the beginning was the word. And of course, the, this is the month that we are to reflect on the word. In the beginning was the word, and the words with God, and then the word became flesh and dwelled among the people. I saw that in them, in their network. They made the word become flesh because they're living it. They're living the thing uh, that the book says they should be doing. And I, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be there, to experience that, and then now we'll find in more ways to work with them so we can maximize the good that we all are doing. And then we it go a lot further. So we thank you, uh, Elder Carter, for being with us and there are members of his uh, community here with us as well. So I now turn it over to you to give us some comments. Thank you, my dear friend. Uh, Imam Talib Sharif is a, is a very dear friend and we had an enjoyable trip to Utah and uh, we enjoy his association. Ramadan Mubarak, I feel Mubarak. very humbled to be here during this most sacred month and I respect and love what you are doing. I also want to express our love for each of you believe you're our brothers and we love you and we will stand by your side and we believe you're our sisters and we love you dearly and we're grateful to be part of this wonderful interfaith community. Um, fasting is a significant uh, principle in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fasting is the voluntary abstinence of both food and drink and um, it is for the development of spiritual strength we believe that Adam and his posterity fasted and required and received that strength from fasting. And uh, we follow the, some of the teachings of Isaiah in the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Um, Isaiah teaches us that fasting, two things I'll summarize, that fasting should be done with a purpose, a very specific purpose, not just something in general, but a purpose. For example, I desire to be a better father. I desire to be a better husband. I desire to be better in, the, in my community to help my fellow man. That would be a very specific thing we would fast for. And in addition, when we fast, we always pay an offering. We pay an offering that would then help clothe the, na the, the naked and, and feed those that are hungry and to help our fellow man. So Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, again, to receive spiritual strength and knowledge. When we fast, helps us understand and feel our reliance upon our God, whom you call Allah and we call Elohim, and we love him, and we revere him, and 
we honor him. And when we're fasting, we recognize our dependence upon him. And we're grateful for all of the bounties and the blessings that are provided to us. And we're mindful that there are many who don't have those bounties. And so we give an offering to help those who do not have those bounties. So our church worldwide fasts every first Sunday of every month. And we do it collectively. This is the first Sunday of the month. This was our fast Sunday. We fast for 24 hours. It's an abstinence of both food and drink. We would usually start on a Saturday after lunch. We would then, with a purpose and a prayer, set apart our fast, tell our Heavenly Father why we're fasting, and we would then fast for 24 hours. So we would not have dinner that evening or breakfast. Sunday, and we'll go without food or drink, and that happens worldwide in our church every first Sunday. Those who fast would then pay an offering of the value of those two meals, or much more, ten times more if they're able. That money then is collected to help the poor in each congregation, a father who's lost a job, someone who's struggling, and the way that's dispersed, this this donation worldwide funds what we call a bishop's storehouse. And you were able to see a bishop's storehouse in Salt Lake when we were there. Think of a, a grocery store that has all goods in it. This family then could come in and shop for what they need, and all of that's provided by the offerings that are given from those who fast. And it helps support them. And so that they can maintain their dignity, it's not just given to them for free they have an opportunity to provide service back to maybe serving someone else who's in need so that they feel good about what they're receiving. But this happens worldwide, and these offerings fund a network where we are, as Imam uh, mentioned, developing and, and canning and um, making food a variety of quantities that we ship throughout the world. And these donations are such now that they don't only feed our congregations, but they feed the world. And we have a humanitarian program where we, uh, we, we, sh we ship food all over the world with a various transportation network. We have a variety of, of semi-trucks that we ship food um, to a variety of places. Every fall, we ship a semi-load of food to a variety of food banks here, the Maryland Food Bank, the D.C. Food Bank, a food bank in, in West Virginia. And all of this is funded by these offerings that we give on a monthly basis. Okay? We also follow the teachings of Jesus Christ when we fast. I'm now in the New Testament. I'm in the book of Matthew. And I'll just read the three quick verses, um, starting in verse 16, of what Jesus Christ taught about fasting. He said, Moreover, when you fast, <coughs> excuse me, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which seeth in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So when we fast, we don't make, uh, we don't do it for acknowledgement. We don't even want anyone to know we're fasting. We only want our Heavenly Father to know that we're fasting. And I heard those words from you today, and I really appreciate them. We want God, our Heavenly Father, to know that we're fasting because we love him and we want to help our fellow man. And so we don't appear to fast. No one would know that we're fasting uh, if, if they were to see us in that regard. So fasting is a, is a very uh, wonderful privilege that happens once a month for our congregations. In addition, individually, we may fast more often than that. I fast more often than once a month. And again, if we needed something personally, we could fast at any time during a month. It would be the same 24 hours. We would give an offering, as I've mentioned. But we fast for a variety of reasons. I feel impressed to share maybe a personal story that would help, I think, underline the importance of fasting in our lives. <clears throat> My wife and I have six children. Four of them are married. Our third married child and his wife were told that they would never have children. And um, they sought out the best medical advice and help from medical professionals and tried everything they could, uh, 
tried for seven years to see if there was a way for them to have a child. And they finally came to our family and said, could we collectively fast? Could all of us fast for the purpose that we might have a child? And could we all petition our Heavenly Father in a same united way to see if he will bless us with a child? And so we did. As a family, we united. We all started our fast with prayer. We pleaded with our Father in Heaven to please pr provide this righteous blessing to our family, but acknowledge that if it doesn't happen, we still love you, and we will honor you, and we will serve you. But if it's your righteous desire, we would love for this family to have a, a child. We then paid an offering, as taught by uh, Isaiah. And then in the scriptures, it also talks about our faith, if it's not coupled with works, is in vain. And so in addition to exercising our faith, setting apart our fast, pleading with God for this miracle to happen, and give, providing an offering, we, in various locations that we were throughout the United States, found service projects in the community. And we all went into the community and served our fellow man in addition to show our faith by our works. And uh, this was a very sacred event for our family. And we pled and, and received strength from this collective fasting that we did. And in January of this year, a miracle was born into our family. And it was just terrific. Thank you, really greatly appreciate that. Uh, Elder, Elder uh, Father Wood, really appreciate it. Again, again, I hope everybody's listening because this is unity in diversity, you know, uh, fasting in the various traditions. Uh, you know, Allah says that he created us meat to out of the food. You know, he lets us know, he speaks about, you know, he gets to our attention. Oh, you who say you're in the state of belief. I, I made you from a male and a female. So he's speaking, he's getting everybody. Now, first you're like, look yourself. Did I come from a male and a female? Is there anybody who didn't come from a male and a female? So that started getting us on a common page. You know, we all, everybody's a composition of male and female. There's no one just said macho. Because in me is my mother and my father. And not just my mother and my father, their parents are in me too. So I'm not no 100% macho, you know. Uh, certainly, certainly the, the um, biology you know, God put me in wants me to perform in that role. That's my constitution. Uh, but in me is a male and a female. And then he says that he made us different. He said he made us different. And so diverse. Li te'arafu. And again, that's classical language. But that means that you should know in you what's different. You should know yourself because now you can share with somebody else. If you don't know yourself, you don't have anything to share with anybody else. So God said, I made you different, so now you'll be curious. And you wanna to get to know each other. And you see, even in, even in the diversity, we, 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 we see the unity in terms of, we may do things differently, but we still do them. And just listening to the, the beauty here. And then uh, the not fasting for the world's eye, but before God. You know, God says specifically, he said, fasting, a psalm fasting is for me. Why did he say that? Because really, our prayers are for God too. He actually says that too. He says, akimu salat li vikri. And make your prayer, establish your prayer in remembrance of me. But he said, fasting is because he knows the tendencies in us. There's some people they look at fasting as an opportunity to lose weight. And they'll fast to lose weight. Or they'll fast to be in shape. You got some people, they don't care how they look as long as they're healthy. You know? And so God also, he's speaking to the wealthy person, those who have means, who would never have to ever go hungry if God didn't ask them to. And so now they go hungry and it makes them more sensitive and now they're doing that because their creator asked them to. And they're more sensitive. And they're looking for opportunities now to help because they felt that burning sensation of hunger and understand. So we really appreciate uh, what's, what was being shared uh, with, with us. Um, 
and he fasts every Sunday. Now, the days they're fasting, now, I didn't plan that, that we'd be in unity in, in that today uh, as well. Also today, this is, this is the unity day. Some of you know this is unity day, uh, and I know he's going to speak to unity day in, in just a minute here when, it's, when he's be speaking. Uh, but there have been over more than 20 service things going on over DMV. How many? Yeah, about 20. Just service things, helping, feeding, whatever the case may be. And, we, and, there, and then there are a few things like this that after the end of the day, we come together to be more reflective with this. You know, so Almighty God wants us to come together to get to know each other. And says not, not, not that we should despise each other, because he knows that's going to be the thing now. Is my differences, make, does it make me better than you? My shade, my belief, does that make me better than you? So he's given us a formula. Look, you come from the same, you have the same origin. I made you differently so you can get to know each other and be curious. And he, said, and he says this. He says, the best of you, because he knows how we are. We want to know who's better. He says, the best of you is the one that's more regardful of me and does good in the society. That's the best of you, not the color of your skin, not these other things, not your nationality, not your ethnicity, et cetera. What you do in remembrance of me, because he know how we are. And so we are just, this is, what, this is an opportunity for us to get to know each other. And we're here and we're sharing. And I hope you hear the beauty uh, in, what we, in what, what's being shared here. The Almighty God wants us to come together, not to be working in opposition against each other. He never wanted the, the followers of one prophet to be fighting the followers of another prophet. Doesn't make any sense, does it? No, we're all, we're all followers of the prophets and the significant figures in history, in human history, who work for the betterment of all of mankind. And we know in the Quran, all of those who do good are in one scriptural reading. We don't have to see ourselves separate. You know, we're in one scriptural reading, which is a very important uh, piece for us. Uh, Elder, in that newspaper there, I hope you get that newspaper, he makes a very profound statement, not just him, but he's, 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 he's bringing up a statement that was made by one of his founders in the early 1800s about Prophet Muhammad, prayers and peace upon him, and Islam, and Abraham. Uh, very profound. And it wasn't said just in that, now in the early 1800s, Islam was not even established as a way of life, as an open practice way of life in America. It wasn't established until 1900s, actually. And then we started getting emotion past 1920s, 30s, and really started picking up. So when his, in his history, one of his early followers made it, and then, and then, then uh, there's another statement made after that one, echoing the same thing. And I'm gonna tell you, I was just out there with them, and their president echoed the same statement today. So what was said in the early 1800s about Islam, about Prophet Muhammad, they echo that again in current times. And we, are, we, we just appreciate that. Coffee was there with us. They fell in love with her. And of course, you'll see her in that newspaper as well. But uh, we appreciate it. We want to now hear from our dear brother, uh, Father Chiyanka, uh, uh Candace. He is, uh, in fact, he and I, we've been spending some time together a couple of times with, with Global Peace. Uh, he's from Nigeria. He's an official of the Global International, it's International Global Peace Foundation. Uh, we did presentations in Korea. We were in South Korea a few months ago. And uh, he did a dynamic presentation. And I just had to have him. I, told, I think I told him that I wanted to have him come here and speak. After, I had never heard, we've been seeing each other, been working with Global Peace, but I hadn't really heard him do a presentation like that until what I heard him do in, in, uh, in Korea. And it was a very historical time for us because it was the 100th anniversary of Korea as one, right? Very historical. They had big celebrations all across the country and we were all was dealing with trying to help them become one. And, uh, uh, but we're very pleased to have uh, you with us, uh, Father, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Thank you, Imam Sharif. And um, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm very happy to be among you today. One of the things John Paul II said in 1986 that helped to bring um, religious leaders together was that 
our coming together does not diminish us. It helps us to be better, especially from different religious traditions. When we come together, we appreciate one another. And um, in 2006, uh, Madeleine Albright, one of the um, most popular American diplomats, in her book, The, um, the Mighty and Almighty, said that religious traditions collectively have more resources, commitment, personnel to build peace in the world, to build reconciliation more than any government in the world. And um, my research recently, I just defended my PhD in development studies and public policy, policy. I researched on religion, peace building, and human security in Africa. And that statement came out strongly in my research. We have a lot to offer humanity. We have a lot to do to bring humanity together. And this um, team, unity in diversity, a very important team in this time. And looking at fasting is another important aspect of our religious life, our humanity, and how we can build a more peaceful, just society where every human being is respected because of the dignity the human person possesses, not based on any social ascription as offered by the society, but that which has come down from God, from Allah. So I want to focus on Christianity, but I will narrow it down to the Catholic faith. Um, we start every conversation on fasting with Jesus' experience in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, reading down. When Jesus Christ went into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil, the first thing the devil asked him to do was to turn stone into bread. And that's the problem of food, the problem of material wealth, the problem of material well-being, the second temptation was about power and wonder. If you are able to jump down, he said, and the devil quoted the scriptures. He said, he will give his angels guard over you. You will not strike your foot against a stone. And the third one is about authority, popularity. The devil told Jesus Christ, I will give you all this. Showed him the beauty of the world. If you worship me. Now, Jesus Christ after that became very, very hungry. After 40 days and 40 nights. That's the foundation of Christian fasting. But you know that Christianity has a lot of connection with Judaism. For instance, it was within the context of the Passover that Jesus Christ instituted the Eucharist. It was within that context. So a lot of relationship in terms of moving from, like Imam Shiru said, look back what was there before you. And from that Matthew chapter 4, Jesus Christ again, as Elder Kadru made clear, Jesus Christ gave instruction on how Christians should fast. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 16 to verse 18, that when you fast, you don't want to look like hypocrites. You have to dress well. You have to look good because you are not fasting for yourself. You are 
fasting to get into deeper relationship with God. So fasting has a spiritual undertone. It also has a powerful social undertone. But the spiritual is very important. And that spiritual is to understand that we depend on God. If it is about um, reducing the amount of food you consume, those who go to the gym do the same when they have very good looking shape. But what, what makes a difference here is the spiritual undertone of what we are doing. Now, from a historical development point of view, one of the major documents of the apostles called the Dick Dake, written between 1780 and 140, recommended two days of fast for every Christian in the post-apostolic tradition. So in second century, fasting was about preparation for the event of Easter. And the second century uh, Christianity recommended three days of fasting. But in, in, in the third century, they looked at the two important days. The day Peter denied Jesus Christ and the day Jesus Christ was crucified. So the early church peaked Wednesday and Friday. But coming to the fourth century, the fasting became a part of being consumed in the experience of Jesus Christ in, in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And that's the beginning of Lent, 40 days, 40 nights of Lent. We just concluded that and celebrated Easter. The 40 days, 40 nights starts with Ash Wednesday when we uh, distribute ashes and the ashes remind us of our nothingness, of our complete dependence on God, that without God, we are nothing. So that's why you cannot engage in fasting without prayer and alms giving. In Matthew chapter uh, 6 again, you, you are not just fasting because you want to chastise your body. That is something you are looking for. Fasting is not an end in itself. So going further, Thomas Aquinas, one of the um, 13th century scholars, said that there are three reasons we fast. You know, connecting to uh, humility, um, mourning for sin, and the quest for holiness. This trade. Thomas Aquinas then added the killing of lust in the human person and then setting our mind towards heaven and mourning for our sins. When you look at these three, you then move to what is the result? What is the goal? Why do we fast? Why is it important that we fast? For the sixth, in 1966 said that it is about self-discipline and with prayer and thanksgiving the human person is liberated that fasting liberates us John Paul II recently said that fasting is about human therapy of the mind because we live in a world filled with affluence. Sometimes, fasting helps us connecting to humility, holiness, and mourning for sin, that it is our therapy also. That sometimes, we can step back and ask ourselves, where are we going? But as I said at the beginning, this is not about reducing the amount of food we consume. That's not what fasting is. Fasting is deeply spiritual. Fasting is about repentance. It's about humility. It's about holiness. And these three structures lead us to the result of fasting. So fasting then is not about 
asking God what I, I want it to do for me. Fasting is connecting ourselves to what God is doing, aligning ourselves to what God is doing. And that which God is doing connects to the pain humanity faces, to the pain individuals face. We connect ourselves to that which God grieves for. That which God grieves for is a destruction of the dignity of the human person. Because we all have one root. We are all children of God. We are all from one family. And when one person is destroyed, humanity is destroyed. John Paul II, Pope Francis said, it is the defeat of humanity. So our fasting should ordinarily lead us to the appreciation and the promotion of the dignity of the other person. To recognize that when we chastise our body through fasting, we are trying to grow spiritually and see that our freedom is appreciated in our dependence on Allah, in our dependence on God. That freedom that helps us to walk away to order our disordered and distorted relationship with the material world. This is what fasting does in our lives as human beings. It helps us to reorder. It helps us to recognize, to enter the humanity of the other person. Because uh, as Elder Karut said, when you fast, you save to give to the poor and those who are in need, the underserved. It helps us to recognize that I have not achieved this because I'm so powerful, because I'm so intelligent, because I can do good business. I've achieved it because of what we call the grace of God at work in us. And when I reach out to the humanity of the other person, my fasting becomes very profound. And above all, our fasting should lead us to understanding that peace in the world is very important. And peace is possible. We can reach the goals of peace when we recognize the fruit of fasting shared by all religious traditions and how we can use this to advance peace and not allow different religious traditions to be vilified. It is about coming together. It is about understanding what we share, the common values that belong to all of us because we trace our roots to the same God. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. I know um, there's a lot in what you said, quite a, quite a bit in that. I know Muslims can identify with a lot of what you said in terms of what fasting is to us uh, as well. And again, that shows us uh, how close we really are. And that's why Allah says uh, in, the, in the Quran uh, that fasting uh, is prescribed for you as it was for those before you. So we can communicate and talk about that and continue to learn and build um, and you, you made me think of something when you were speaking about um, uh, Jesus' fast, uh, peace be upon him, uh, about his mother. And uh, so, so you all should know, we, we're hearing about the, the various male figures, uh, but the Quran says that Mary fasted. But her fast was a different type of fast, because what did she fast from? Anybody know? She fasts from speaking. She fasts from speaking. And, that's the, and the word that says that is son. The same word for fast is used for her from not speaking. She fasts from speaking to anyone. That was, that was the sign. And uh, so, and that's in the Quran. That's in our holy book. You know, whole chapter talking about Mary. And then that, that piece is in there. See how closely 
Uh, we really are. And I like what he said. He, and this is important to Muslims because he said, he said, he said, fasting is to get us closer to Almighty God. We're trying to close the distance. Sometimes we, we, we create distance, but it helps us eliminate the distance and get closer so we can fulfill our created purpose. All of us have a created purpose that Almighty God put us on. And we miss that. If we're away from him, we miss that communication. I mean, I was telling my, grand, my uh, nephew, he was getting off track. I was telling him about his fingerprint. You know, there's a billion people, over more than a billion that have come and gone, and they have, no one has the same one. And they said, there's what, uh, six, almost seven billion on the planet right now, and everybody have their own fingerprint, and those are the common things. There's something for you. You got to come into your created purpose, what you're created for, your, what is your signature that God has for you. You miss that if there's distance between you and your creator. So fasting helps you connect back with your created uh, purpose so you can get to your destiny without being distracted uh, by these things in the world that take us away uh, from, that, from that focus. Uh, great, greatly, uh, greatly appreciate it. And the dignity of the person, very, very important things that we're hearing here in terms of what fasting should help us to do is really about humanity. And he mentioned about peace. You know, it's, that's important. When that baby comes here in the months of Ramadan, it's about peace. You don't want to disturb that. And that's, that's human. That's all of human life. And we are to work to keep that state of peace in our life. And he said together. The religions all together can achieve it if we all work together. It's more people in the world that are religious than not. So if we did work together, we could achieve it. And uh, myself and uh, Dr. Frazier was on the radio show today. Uh, one of the verses was read from the Quran that said that God, God says in the Quran, say, if I wanted you all to believe exactly the same, I could have made you do that. God's saying that if he wanted to, for us to believe the same, he said he could have done that. Almighty God. So who are we to try to force somebody to make somebody believe what we believe if God could do that? And he said that if he wanted that, we're saying that's not what he wanted. And you see, we're able to benefit. And we know some people, they get, they get radical, they get extreme. And a lot of our faiths have that. But that's all we think about doing. But God said the one who gets the honor is not the belief, not your, your, your label, your nationality. The one that gets the honor is who's working for God. You know, uh, he quoted Jesus, peace be upon him. And Jesus said, can't you see? I was put here. He said, I must be about my father's business. And I know the Christian was identified with that. And he was essentially saying, I was put here to do the works and the will of Almighty God. All of us. And that's what we're here for, to do just that. And we thank you, Father, for sharing with us uh, those wonderful comments. And our last but not the least, certainly not the least, uh, we're going to hear from our dear Rabbi uh, Jerry Sirota. He and I have become very close working together. He's the executive director of the Interfaith Conference, and we, I'll give you a little bit of history on that. And uh, he and I, we kind of tag team a lot of different events throughout the city with our positions. And uh, I'm always, I feel better when I have him around. And uh, we have 11 uh, permanent members now, right? Our faiths have grown, but we have more faiths in that that are involved in what we're doing. We're bringing together and we're able to get more things done. And we're not just coming together just like we're doing talking and doing educational stuff. And we're working together in the community. We're doing things, we got the youth together, doing leadership training. We do service together in the community. We, we get with each other we, and, and we feed. We go to shelters, we do things, we play games with them. We do things to make them show that they're human, you know, and treat them and speak to them like they're somebody because they are somebody. Everybody's somebody and everybody is special. If God created you, you are special. How will you somebody tell you that you're not special? So they should be treated this, that way as well because they have to have their dignity as our Father said. So I want to bring up our uh, Rabbi uh, Sirota, uh, Executive Director of the Interfaith Conference. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much uh, for, thank you all for being here. Uh, uh, thank you to my fellow uh, teachers uh, and learners and disciples. Um, uh, I've already learned a tremendous amount. And uh, just as uh, Bill Aiken said at the beginning, we can all grow in our own traditions by sharing this kind of uh, wisdom across traditions. Uh, I don't want to speak, uh, if I have time at the end, I'll say something about the Interfaith Conference and about Unity Day, but I do 
remember the last time I was here. I've been here many times. Uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, it's beautiful always to be here. But the last time I was here was the day that we heard about what happened in New Zealand. Uh, it was Juma prayer, and uh, there were many of us from different faiths here, uh, and we spoke on that occasion. Uh, and uh, it's such a joy to be here speaking about uh, our faith and our, our uh, commitment to making this a better world together. Uh, and it, it just, it's a reflection of, uh, of where we need each other, but also how we can deepen each other's connection uh, with the Holy One. Uh, I, was, I came from the Hindu temple in Lana, Maryland, because this is our Interfaith Council Day of Unity. And this afternoon, they were having a program on protecting or securing your house of worship. We had people from at least six or seven different faiths there. Uh, and it was a powerful lesson, but it was a sad lesson. Uh, uh, and I'm just um, I'm so appreciative of being able to be here uh, and, to, and to look forward to the, the coming of Ramadan uh, and the opportunity for reflection that that provides. There are, uh, the reasons for fasting in Jewish tradition are very, very close to the reasons that have already been explained. Uh, I would call, I would see four reasons, um, and I start with repentance as the first one, uh, because the, the classical fast in uh, Jewish tradition is the fast that we are commanded uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, it's the fast of Yom Kippur, Yom HaKippurim. Uh, the Day of Atonement. And that's a once a year fast. It's a 24 plus hour fast. You have to start, all days start in the evening as they do in Islam. Uh, so you start with sundown, you go to the following sundown, but nobody would just start right at sundown. You would want to start a little before, and you want to start a little after, and you want to keep praying. Uh, even if you finish the, the prayers for the Yom Kippur, you add the prayers for the next evening before you break the fast. So it's really a 25-hour fast. Um, uh, and there are two 25-hour fasts in Judaism as it developed. Only one of them is mentioned as required in the Bible, uh, but there's a second fast. That fast, of course, is, a, is a, an occasion of great joy. Um, even though it's solemn, that's when, if we do what we need to do on that day, and the 10 days before, then we are forgiven. Um, so there's great joy in the, in the, in the fast. But I, I'll explain a little bit later what it is that we, uh, aside from uh, five different times, we have uh, prayers of uh, uh, forgiveness for the sins we, we have committed. All of those sins are expressed in plural terms. It's not a personal confession. It's a confession of the entire community. We may be guilty of a, B, and C, our neighbor may be guilty of D, E, and F, and our sister may be G, H, and I, but we are part of a community and we're responsible for each other. Uh, so all of those things are prayed consistently throughout the day, but there's a feeling of great joy and liberation at the end of the day. Um, there's one other time, aside, many of those prayers are said throughout the 10 days of, uh, of penitence, they're called. 10 days of turning around. Uh, but there's one other time uh, in the course of a person's life, hope, hopefully only one other time, uh, although it can be uh, more, than, more than once in that tradition, when you also fast and recite those prayers. And that is the day of a, the, of the wedding, the day of a marriage. The couple also fasts up until the time of the uh, wedding because they are asking to be forgiven, to be relieved of burdens, and to be starting a new life together. So there are actually many, many historical fasts, um, some of which are uh, customary in some communities and not uh, others, which are half-day, what we would consider half-day fasts, or day daylight fasts. Of course, with Ramadan now, it's more than half a day. Uh, uh, but it's the daylight fasts. Uh, one of them, 
is called a miniature or a, a lesser Yom Kippur, uh, and it's the day before the new moon. So it's a monthly fast, but it's the, the daylight hours before the new moon is sighted. And many people fast monthly on, uh, in a similar way to what we heard of the uh, tradition of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, there are a number of other fasts. Many people fast on Monday and Thursdays. Those particular days were market days. Um, and when the world is out of whack, or the community is out of whack, or nature is out of whack, uh, if there's not rain when there needs to be rain, um, then people would fast on Mondays and Thursdays, the market days, in, in the hopes, in that case, it's a, fair of uh, a, a fast of supplication. So we fast in Judaism primarily for repentance. That's the, the most powerful fast that we have. But we also have the fast of supplication. I'm so moved by the story of Elder Calderwood's family. Uh, uh, when we really want to ask something of God, fasting is considered one of the ways of doing that, whether it's individually or collectively. Uh, that. Uh, it's a prayer of supplication. Now, there is another uh, a woman in the Hebrew scriptures who fasted. Uh, um, Mary, of course, is not in our scriptures. But who, who else fasted as a prayer of supplication? I knew he would, I knew he would know. That's why. I did. Of course, Esther as a prayer of supplication because her, her people in that kingdom wherever it was, not so clear where it was, but uh, the, the authorities then said, well, oh, these people aren't like us. They're coming across the border. They don't speak the same language we do. Uh, they don't respect the, uh, uh, the emperor or the czar or whoever, uh, and we're going to wipe out these, these people. They don't have a right to be here. And Esther fasted for three days that she would have the courage to uh, ask uh, the ruler for the, the uh, saving her people. So that, that, there's another sister who, uh, who fasted besides uh, uh, Mary or Mariam. Um, the, uh, there are two other reasons that Judaism speaks in, in cases where Judaism speaks about fasting. One is in mourning, um, and, and the other is as a, as a discipline. Um, and that's usually an individual fast. Um, uh, it isn't required, but Feel, if people feel moved to, to fast, it's, it's permitted. I would say it's permitted. Um, Judaism, uh, and here I reflect on what uh, Brother Bill said at the beginning, Judaism, and I know this is also true in Islam, uh, in the philosophical side of Judaism, is looking for the middle way. Uh, it comes, uh, I didn't realize it also came from the Buddha, it comes from Aristotle, it comes through Arabic philosophy into uh, Jewish philosophy, the golden mean. Uh, uh, that's the, we're, we're looking for the golden mean. God doesn't want us, uh, there, there may be holy people who fasted for 40 days. Moses, by Jewish tradition, fasted for 40 days when he was up on the mountain receiving revelation. So it's not surprising that Jesus, in a similar model, uh, would have fasted for 40 days. But that's nowhere commanded or expected. Uh, in fact, we're, we're commanded the opposite. If someone does not experience the permitted pleasures of the world, there are some things that are forbidden, but the permitted pleasures uh, of the world, they're, they are not um, appreciating what God has provided for us in the world. We're commanded to experience the pleasures, the permitted pleasures of this world. Um, uh, and one, it's a reason why the, the Nazarite, in the, uh, the Nazarite is someone in the, uh, oh, in the Hebrew scriptures who gives up wine and in some cases gives up eating meat. But the Nazarite has to bring a sin offering because the Nazarite has, has, has uh, uh, not accepted what God has given us to, in the world, part of God's bounty. Um, so that's actually a sin to not experience the, the positive things that are permitted to us. However, we should be saying a blessing. We should be consciously mindfulness in our eating. Um, if we enjoy something of God's uh, bounty and don't say a blessing beforehand, 
That's like stealing. That's like stealing from God. So mindfulness in the way we eat and in the way we don't eat is something that's also very important in the Jewish tradition. I think the, uh, the historical half-day uh, fasts are connected primarily in the Jewish calendar with the destruction of the temple, which was a, both a reality, a reality as far as we're concerned, but a metaphor for the absence of God in the world. And the stages of that destruction are marked on the calendar, on the, on the Hebrew calendar, and there are people who, who fast, daylight fast during the uh, time of the calendar. Um, there are two scriptures, and with this I'll conclude, that are part of that intense uh, Yom, Yom Kippur, 25-hour fast. Although I should mention, I, I didn't mention, the other 25-hour fast is related to the destruction of the temple. Historically, apparently it is also true that the ninth of Av, which is the ninth of the uh, fifth day, in the, uh, the fifth month of the uh, Hebrew calendar, uh, was also the day, it was the destruction of both of the, uh, the ancient temples date of the proclamation of the, ex, uh, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain and had some uh, connection with dates during the Holocaust. But it's, so it's a national day of mourning, and that is also a fast day, a 25-hour fast. But on Yom Kippur, the day that the most intense fasting takes place, uh, like in Islam, as I understand it, uh, uh, those 25-hour fasts are fasts from fasting from liquid, from drinking, they're fasting from sexual relations, uh, and fasting from bathing and anointing, as well as not wearing leather shoes, which are the most comfortable shoes then. Now they have the most comfortable shoes, I guess. But, but leather, because you have to also take the life of an animal to have the leather, there's a, there's a certain compassion in not wearing leather uh, shoes. So all those things are forbidden on those days, except for people, women who are pregnant, or nursing, and people who are sick, they're not permitted to fast. It's actually uh, would be violating God's law for, for people in those conditions to fast. And the definition of who's too sick to fast is always on the side of leniency. If the, per the doctor says, you're well enough to fast, you just have to hold. The person says, I don't think you're well enough to fast, you listen to the person. The person says, I'm ready to fast. The doctor said, dangerous for you to fast. You listen to the doctor. So it's always on the, on the uh, side of preserving life, the decision about whether to fast or not. We read, two, we read two texts on Yom Kippur. One is the book of Jonah, two texts from the prophets, because we're reading and chanting all, all day long. Uh, the prophet Jonah, which was prophet who was sent to, you could call them an infidel people, you could call them whatever you want, the people of Nineveh, who weren't part of the, the holy community, uh, and they were warned by the prophet Jonah about the destruction, and, they, and the, the king believed the prophet, and the people, all of them fasted, and they were forgiven. So that's what, uh, it's not the fast that you're doing because your tradition tells you to fast. Fasting and repentance is available for all of you. Your tribe or your group. We're reminded of that. But the most important text that we read, which has already been mentioned by Elder Calderwood, is from uh, Isaiah 58, um, where people sometimes get a little bit caught up in, uh, in the fact that they're fasting. Look, God, I'm, I'm, I'm fasting. Why aren't you paying attention to me? I'm fasting. Not only that, I'm wearing sackcloth and ashes. observer that you've ever seen, and, and we are reminded that that isn't what God wants us to do. There is a purpose in the past, as has been beautifully said already. Uh, why, is it, this is from Isaiah, this, why is it that we have fasted and you don't, you don't see us suffering? We're pressing down our ears. God, you don't pay attention. God says, on the very day you are fasting, you're scrabbling for wealth. On the very day you fast, you are pressing your workers. 
Root fast and strife and contention. You strife with a wicked fist. You're not fasting in a way that I'm going to listen to you with my eye. Is that the kind of fast that I desire? Is it a day for people to just press down their egos? Am I commanding you to droop your head like bulrushes and lie around in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast day? Is that what God would want? Isaiah says, this is the kind of fast, saying in God's name. This is the kind of fast that I desire. Unlock the shackles put on by wicked power. Untie the ropes of the yoke. Let the oppressed go free. Break off every yoke. Share your bread with the hungry. Bring the poor, the outcasts to your house. When you see them naked, clothe them. From your own flesh and blood, don't hide yourself. Then your light will burst out as the dawn. And then when you cry out to God, God will say, here I am. If you banish the yoke from your midst, if you rid yourself of finger pointing and words of contempt, if you open up to the life experience of the hungry and soothe the life that's been trampled underfoot, then you shall be like a garden giving water, like a wellspring waters never fail. And you shall lay foundations for coming generations. You shall be called those in many torn places. Those who narrow the bridge. You shall be called those who build lanes to live in. That's the fast that God wants. Wonderful, wonderful. So we are uh, at the concluding of this event. Uh, that was, uh, and I know we heard a lot of similarities. You've heard he's the last one, and again, like you said, he kind of summarized and showed a lot of the likeness uh, in how we are. And I know Muslims who were listening to what he was saying, you heard so many similarities uh, in the repentance, the forgiveness, that even deals with the, even the, the way Ramadan is broken down, uh, the mercy, forgiveness, et cetera, uh, in, the, in, the, in the days. And uh, he mentioned, he mentioned uh, about this mindfulness in the way we eat. Uh, and if some of you don't know that during this month of Ramadan, what will be starting tomorrow is we're, we're encouraged when we break the fast, uh, it what's called iftar. Iftar. I, want, I may have to make a few comments about iftar. When we break the fast, you should break the fast with uh, something natural, a date, some orange, or watermelon, something like that. And, uh, and so the, the, the message, when you tell me being mindful, so this is, this is the message here. And this is the, the tradition that we've been given. And if you even look at uh, some of how they broke that fast too, the, the other prophets, you will see this, the same message here that God is saying, when you come off the fast, to break the fast, eat from what God has prepared first. Eat from God's table. Then eat from what man has prepared. So this is being mindful of how we think. If we approach man first and then go to God, then we flipped it and we missed. But look at, look at it. When we come here from the mother's womb in the ninth month, we're not able to eat from man's table, are we? In a state of nature, in the ninth month, you begin to eat from what Almighty God has prepared. And what Almighty God has prepared, and look at where he puts the food at. You know, the food that he has prepared is right where the mother wants to hold the new life. Right by the heart. And that's a communication from Almighty God. If we eat from what he has prepared, it will have the right compassion and sensitivity for humanity and we'll be healthy human beings. And then later the child can eat, but that's the basis, that's the foundation of that life first, eating from what God has prepared. And so he said, think the same way. We should approach what God, what did God have to say first before we go see what man has to say? And uh, we just wanna uh, show that we're very grateful uh, to this panel. I've learned a lot. And I've, I'm working with most of these, and actually we spend a lot of time together, and I've learned a lot. And so I know you have, if I spend a lot of time with them, more than probably most of you, and I'm learning and writing and taking notes. And I hope you have learned. We've also captured this. If you want to get a copy of it, we captured it uh, as well. 
and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from him again uh, at another occasion that's coming up soon. And uh, we appreciate it. This was a great way to start. This is the eve of the month of Ramadan of fasting. This was a beautiful way to start uh, in showing unity in our diversity. And I know you felt it. I know you heard it. I know you sensed it. You know, and this, and this communication is coming from Almighty God that's showing us that we are always going to be more alike than not alike. And he's always telling us that, that, that the things that unite us, and we're hearing the unity in this, will always be bigger, will always be greater, will always be more important than the things that divide us. The things that unite us will always be bigger than the things that divide us. So we want to, uh, we're going to have to close now because they've been petitioning me because there's some food, and they say the food may be getting cold, and I don't want to, I want to respect the people who, who prepared it and got things ready. Uh, and please uh, engage uh, the panel. Uh, some of them may have to leave, because I, I think I said 7 o'clock, so some have to leave. But if not, please feel free to come up, thank them, share with them some of your thoughts, ask a question. Uh, uh, they're good people. They don't bite. You know, we <laughs> Now, we're very grateful to have, have friendships with them. We, we, we think we want to also acknowledge our family here from the uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. I don't know if our, we had some uh, officials, some government officials from um, Denmark uh, was supposed to come and be with us, uh, too. And uh, I don't know if they made it or not. Uh, and, uh, so they may come at some point. Yes. And uh, well, I don't, I don't want to open up something. I want to respect the time now. But that's why I say you can come up and, 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 and get with them. But I want to certainly open up for you to go get some food for, for the person who can leave and then they want to do the cleaning. So I want to respect that and, and uh, I, I, I apologize we went over. Uh, but I begin, I hope that this was rewarding. You got some value out of this and, uh, and uh, we are certainly grateful. And we pray that everyone uh, will have a good uh, month of fasting. Good month of fasting. And noting all these things that have been said you know, Almighty God says that, he says that, he says, uh, uh, act thought on that, act thought on that. That's most of the people. You de lune, be ahwai him, be hayril ibn. Most of the people, they are, they are misled. And uh, you heard, the Muslims, I know they heard the word, you uh, dalune, uh, you hear darlene in there, right? We, hear, we say that every day we say Darlene. We don't want to be of those who's gone Darlene. So Almighty God is saying most of the people, they go Darlene, they go astray, they misled because of their appetites that are not checked by God's mouth. And we've been hearing from these sources coming from a state of nature, coming from the creator, God's mouth. Thank you again for your time, for your attention, for being here. I greet you all in greetings of peace. As-salam alaykum. Please, as you socialize, please again take time to go downstairs and grab you something uh, to eat, please, uh, so we can get rid of that food. Inshallah, God will.